it going everyone and welcome back to the Enclave. So, we are here with Module 7, Malfunctions and Maintenance. This is going to be the last section. Um, we are not going to cover the assessment section because that's pretty much been what I've been telling you throughout this book is what it is you need to know. Um, I do recommend going that, over that on your own though. But, anyway, so if we get into section 7, we start off with malfunctions. Um, <clears throat> so everything here, except for the squib load, you are going to treat in the same manner. I fully understand that the book chooses when you tap as well as rack and assess versus when you just rack and assess. But something that my instructor told me, and it actually made a lot of sense, is that instead of trying to memorize different immediate action drills for different malfunctions, you're just better off tap, rack, and assess for every single malfunction. You're better off ejecting around and picking it up, be it at the range or after your self-defense scenario or whatever, then <clears throat> then basically failing to to correct a malfunction because you haven't tapped or you haven't racked or you, whatever the case may be. Okay, so always, no matter the malfunction, tap, rack, and assess. Okay. Now, the squib load. Why I said that was different. So, what is a squib load? A squib load is a round that develops less than normal pressure. So, when you are loading ammunition, you load the nitrite powder, or nitrate powder, whatever you want to call it, gunpowder, pew pew powder, you load that in a measurement called grains. Okay. Now, for instance, you load a bullet with six grains of powder. Now, eh, let's say we're loading a nine millimeter. So we've got like 6.5 grains of powder. Okay. It is not actual grains, like grains of rice. It is a weight. So there will be many grains or granules in a grain, the weight measurement. Okay, just to clarify that because many years ago I actually didn't know that. So maybe you'll learn something there. So bullets are measured and the bullets themselves and the powder are measured in grains. So we have a 6.5 grain load, which is a nominal load. That is your standard pressure for whatever weight of bullet and whatever casing, etc. you have. So you have a 6.5 grain powder load. Okay. When loading, there are obviously three outcomes. You can have a hot load, you can have a nominal load, and you can have a squib load. Now, a hot load is going to basically be, let's say, seven grains and up, for example. What can happen there is when the primer is struck and the powder ignites, <clears throat> you can get an expansion of the case that actually forces the case into your chamber and gets the bullet stuck there. In extreme cases, it can blow your entire chamber apart and potentially kill you. Um, so you get a double load, which is where you will basically dispense powder and then forgetting that you've dispensed powder, you dispense an entirely another load. So you're looking at like 13 grains of powder, for example, in a 9mm bullet, which is way too much. Like, in those scenarios, your gun is screwed. You're pretty much going to blow your gun up. Um, then we get to a nominal load, which is obviously what you're looking for. You're looking for that perfect amount of pressure to give you the best or lowest standard deviation that you can get. So you want your bullets to be as... as um, uniform as possible. That is your obviously nominal load. And then we get to our squib load. So in a squib load scenario, what would happen for example is that your powder dispenser doesn't dispense the full 6.5 grains of powder. So what it does is it'll dispense let's say 3 grains of powder. Which is enough to dislodge the bullet from the casing 
but it is not enough to actually push it past the lands and grooves in your rifling and travel out the barrel. So, somewhere in your barrel, you will have a bullet wedged. <clears throat> now, when performing a tap rack ancestral on a squib load, what will happen is you will eject, or okay, we'll start with a tap. Your magazine will be seated, so that's not going to be the problem. Tap, no problem. We'll then rack, ejecting a clean round or the casing. So either the round will have had enough power to actually push the casing out or it will still be in the actual sort of ejection port. At which point when you rack, you'll eject that round or that case and think cool, present again, fire and you've now fired a bullet into the back of your squib load. So, that is the only one where I'm going to say you're going to need to sort of understand what your ammunition feels like. So that if you shoot two rounds and it's like bang, 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 you need to know that that third bang was not the same as the first two. It was soft, they're often dull, they'll have less of an echo, and immediately then do not fire the next shot. Um, Remove the magazine, clear the firearm, inspect the barrel and chamber, and then continue. Because that is where you will truly damage your firearm. All the rest of the, the malfunctions here, I'm not even going through. Because honestly, they're basic, they're simple, and they're not going to affect you in the grand schemes of things. Um, but a squib load could kill you. Um, a squib load could very easily cost you your life, could cost you your firearm, could cost you your hand, could... I've seen some videos where people literally lose their hand, pieces of the upper receiver of rifles, for those of you who don't remember, upper receiver, basically the round comes up, it explodes in here, and it sends pieces of this up towards your face. Um, I've seen people with charging handles, literally sticking through their cheeks. Um, yeah, things can get horrible, horrible, horrible with squib loads and with hot loads as well. Um, <clears throat> but anyways, so like I say, for every other drill, tap, rack and assess, it is absolutely simple. I can give you a quick demonstration with our little PP226, PP226, PP whatever the hell it is, P226. Okay, so we go bang, bang, click. You basically tap, rack, and back on target. If that racking has not cleared <clears throat> the jam, so for instance, something like a stovepipe jam, what will happen is the casing will actually be stuck here in the ejector port. And what can happen is when you rack, it doesn't actually eject the casing out. What will happen, it has happened to me, is the casing instead of being ejected out will actually fall downwards and basically sit on top of the next round of ammunition um, on top of the magazine at which point you will actually need to rack the slide back and tip the firearm so that that casing comes out and then back on target so tap rack and carry on um, the other example where you will not do the tap rack and assess is a failure to go into battery. I don't personally know how I feel about this because to me if your gun's not going into battery consistently you should take it to a gunsmith and have it inspected, have it maybe worked on um, because basically what will happen is your firearm will sit like this. So as you can see at the back there the slide is not all the way forward. We could obviously still see a bit of barrel on this model. So that is in battery. That It, it can literally be that little. It, it can be millimeters. Um, and then what is sort of recommended for that is you will take your palm and give it a slap on the back there. Firstly, it hurts the hell out of your palm. I didn't even do that properly and that hurt a little bit. It hurts. Secondly, it doesn't always work. For me, if it's a life and death scenario, once again, 
screw that round. Screw it. Tap, rack, get that thing the hell out of there. And pray that once your slide goes back forward, the next round is fully in battery. Once again, if it's not, you got to start questioning whether it's your gun and not the ammunition, you know? So, <clears throat> that is pretty much that. So we have our tap racks and assist, uh, tap racks and assess, um, which is how we're going to deal with all of those malfunctions. Um, yeah, I, <clears throat> hmm, okay, let us see, so yeah, for here, the failure to go into battery, they also recommend a tap rack and assist here, basically, but I have seen numerous instructors, numerous, um, people on YouTube, so I guess gun tubers or whatever, recommend that slam method. And you know what? I'm not going to argue and say, don't do it. You know, if you're a big burly guy and you don't give a crap about hitting the back of your gun, go for it. For me, ah, I, I don't have calloused hands. So like for me, beating on the back of a piece of steel is not something that I want to do, especially if I'm at the range or whatever. In a life and death scenario, a eh, little bit of a different story. But like I say, it is just easiest to tap rack and assess for every draw. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now we move on to maintenance. I see we're already 11 minutes in. Um, I do believe this is going to be quite a long one because this chapter 7 does have quite a few sections in it. So, I mean, that was basically malfunctions. Now we have maintenance. So, care and maintenance of your firearm. This is in every single test. Everyone. You will get this question. It is a guarantee. So, <clears throat> when to clean a firearm? Let's see if you guys can answer this. No, I'm not stupid. I know that <laughs> this is a recording. YouTubers love to do that. Anyway, so the three times that you will clean your firearm after it has been used. So after you spent a day on the range, you want to come home, give your gun a clean. After it has been exposed to the elements. So if you're carrying your firearm on your person, you will most likely sweat. Winter time, this is obviously a little bit less frequent, but summertime, you just want to make sure that you are removing any corrosive elements like sweat off of your firearm. Yeah, easy peasy. If you walk around on the beach and you maybe get a little wet, like all your shorts get wet, there will be salt and things that will end up collecting on your firearm. So once again, after being exposed to the elements and number three, before storage for a period of time. So before you plan on storing your firearm, if you know, okay, I don't have any ammo for this. I'm not going to go buy ammo for this gun for like three months because I've got my other guns and I've got ammo and it's easy to get ammo or whatever. So I'm going to keep this rifle in the safe. You want to give it a nice oiling up inside, outside and leave a nice thin layer of oil on all components. We get to another question in the test. Before firing that weapon, you need to ensure that the barrel is completely clear of oil. That is a question you will most likely be asked. It's not in every test, but it's in, I think, two of the four. Um, yep, yeah, basically, which component can be damaged if oil is not removed or something like that. The, the question goes something along those lines and it's the barrel. So you do want to, if storing the firearm, coat the barrel on the inside with a layer of gun oil. However, you absolutely want to make sure that you go through with the flannel cloths before you shoot that weapon and get all of that oil out the barrel because you do not want an excess of oil in your firearms barrel it can present a similar issue to a squib load. 
where that oil creates so much resistance that it's easier for parts of your gun to go out than it is for that bullet to travel forward. So just something to bear in mind there. Those are two questions, five, well, four marks. Three for the first one, one for the second one. <clears throat> um, cleaning kit components. <sighs> I did get asked this once. Um, fortunately, I memorized all of them, but uh, just know what's in a cleaning kit. So you have your bronze brush, nitrite um, solution, like a, a nitrite solvent, sorry, is what it's called, or powder solvent. You have gun oil, you have a rod, you have flannel patches, you have a jag, and you have, damn, there's one more thing. Let me see if I can remember it. Uh, can't remember. Um, no, that's all of it. Yeah, cleaning rod, bronze brush, jag, flannel patches, nitro solvent, and gun oil. So, beautiful. Um, and then, yeah, that is pretty much that. You are not going to need how to, or you, you're not going to need to know how to clean a firearm. <clears throat> that is sort of between you and your firearm when it, um, when it comes to it. So, now we are on to safety inspections. So, this is also most likely going to be in your test. Three marks. So, we have... When do you carry out a safety inspection? So, before handing a firearm over, when receiving a firearm from somebody else, and before cleaning the firearm. So, those are the three times that you will perform a safety check. So, if I were to hand you the firearm, you would perform the safety check in a perfect world if I knew what I was doing. I would do a safety check. So I would remove the magazine, do what I'm going to do, blah, 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 make sure everything is good, hand you the firearm. You would then perform that safety check as well. And if you were then going to clean that gun, that safety check would obviously be the one that precedes the cleaning, obviously. So, <clears throat> as always, identify a safe direction. Point the firearm in a safe direction, finger off the trigger. Remove the magazine from the firearm, rack the slide to the rear, this will eject any rounds or casings that are still in the firearm. Okay, once again this is going to be difficult because this firearm doesn't stay open on its own. So, what you're then going to do is with your non-gun hand, okay, you're going to pick up your cleaning rod and you're going to insert it down the barrel of your firearm. Okay, I actually... I've got a pencil here, will it fit? Nah, kind of. Okay, so you basically want to insert the cleaning rod down the barrel until it can be seen at your ejection port. Okay, so once you can see the end of the cleaning rod come out of your chamber, okay, you then obviously remove the cleaning rod and can return the firearm to a safe condition, either drop the hammer under control or do what we got to do here. And we have just carried out a safety inspection. So this firearm would now be considered safe to clean or handle. Um, you do also want to make sure that you inspect when that slide is open, you want to inspect your chamber and your magazine wall. That is sort of self-explanatory. You do that period. When you put the slide back, you check your chamber and magazine wall. That should be second nature. Um, clearing the firearm should be second nature. But yeah, so that is it. Um, that is how to perform a safety inspection on a semi-automatic pistol. Um, and the, the revolver is actually pretty much the same, to be honest. I don't normally cover the revolvers, but the revolver is 
exactly the same. You basically flick the cylinder out, put the rod down the barrel, and you're sweet. Mostly just to make sure there's no excess oil or any squib loads or anything else jammed in the barrel of your firearm. Um, yeah, so that is pretty much that. I actually thought there was a little bit more to it than that, but it does seem like that is it. So, with all that being said, we are complete with our International Firearm Academy handle and use of a handgun. US 119649. We are complete. Um, <clears throat> once again, I'd like to thank everyone for watching. I really didn't think that this was going to attract any views, to be completely honest. Um, when I started going down this road, I hunted high and low for any form of information that I could find to sort of help me navigate these books and help me understand them in a real world setting and I couldn't find it so that's when I decided that it was maybe time for me to sit down with the camera and start doing these readings for you and trying to sort of explain what is important what isn't important um, because like I said in one of my other videos I memorized this whole book word for word the law one as well um like you don't need to do that it it doesn't need to be every single word drilled into your head um you can just have an understanding of the book and you will be good um but you do need to have an understanding and some of the things i'll be honest i had a list of questions when i went into my instructor to actually do my test because there were a few things that I didn't agree with or I didn't understand why you would do that. Um, for instance, the tap rack and assess um, situation. Like, like I'd asked him about that basically hammer technique and fine, I did end up doing it. Like he did show me that like it is possible, but at the same time we had one that wouldn't go back into battery. So we had to tap rack and assess anyway. So those sort of things I just wanted to be able to teach you guys and sort of get that message across before you're sitting there with the test in front of you. Because I must admit that firing sequence uh, question that I mentioned in the last video that scared the crap out of me because I was sitting there and I was like, you know this, but do you? Because there was no question about this in the books. There was no information about this in the books as to what happens if your, if your cartridge has no powder in it. They don't tell you that. You have to figure that information out for yourself and understand how to convey that for like five marks. That's a big chunk of material that you need to understand. So that is mostly why I wanted to do these videos. <laughs> if anyone has any feedback on how we can do the rest of the books better, I'm, I'm like looking around me for more of my books that are all in the other room. Um, yeah, we are going to be moving on with the shotgun rifle, bolt action rifle, and then the same for the business purposes. Um, those are going to be for security personnel, police, things like that. Um, those books get in depth. There are some incredible things that you learn in those books. I'm super excited to be able to, to sort of give my, my two cents on the, on the, um, the professional books because wow, there's some cool stuff in there and the, uh, tactical courses as well. I'm definitely going to be teaching you guys tactical maneuvers on the channel. A hundred percent. Um, so yeah, please just stick around. Um, we are going to get started with the next book as soon as possible. And yeah, I, I really do hope that this has in some way helped someone. Um, because th that really is why I'm doing it. I, I just want to be able to, to pass on my knowledge. I love teaching. I love, that's why I'm becoming a firearms instructor. I, I've like given up everything in my life to do this. So, I thought, why not just get a head start on it and help with the things that I could help with now before I'm actually in the position to fully, fully teach.
teach people, you know. Um, but yeah, with that all being said, thank you so much for watching. It has been really fun doing this book. A lot more fun than the law. And I'm super excited to get onto the other guns where we get to play with some bigger toys, you know. Um, yeah, so as always, like, comment, share, subscribe. If you've got a little bit more time, maybe check out another video on the channel. And as always, peace out.